Okay. Welcome, everyone. Thank you for coming this morning to our, and this is going to be the first of many, many puns, uh, for which I apologize in advance, to our master class on mobility as a service. Uh, we have uh, four people here that will serve as discussion leaders. I'll introduce them in a second. Uh, but I want to make sure that you feel uh, the uh, ability to intervene when you want on this discussion. It's not just a discussion that'll take place on stage, it's a discussion with the room as well with some of your insights and some of your questions. So even if you don't raise your hand ahead of time, I'll be coming out to you with some questions that I hope uh, you can answer and contribute to this uh, master class. There is, uh, we've identified a, a few people that are on stage, but there are many people in the room as well that are teachers. And, uh, and so I hope that you will help uh, uh, school us, as, as it were, uh, on what we can expect from the development of mobility as a service. But on stage, we have starting uh, on the far left, uh, Paulo Humanes, who is the Vice President for Global Business Development and New Mobility at the PTV Group. Uh, PTV, the PTV Group specializes in software solutions and consulting services for traffic, transportation, mobility, and logistics. Paolo, I know from many, many discussions, is passionately, interest, passionately interested in the future of transport and the future of mobility, how it can help lives, safety, improving governance, and improving welfare in cities. He's a member of the board of the Mobility as a Service Alliance, the Mass Alliance, and has helped steer PTV towards better understanding the impact of various forms of mass business models and deployment models. Next to him is Krista Huttara Jenks. Uh, she is the head of go-to market, so she'll be our go-to person today, head of ecosystem as well and sustainability at Mass Global. Mass Global is the world's first true mobility as a service operator with its WIM service. Many of you may have heard about it in the news. Maybe many of you have read recently the assessment of WIM's uh, impact, WIMPACT study done by Rambal, uh, looking at the uh, influence that the mobility as a service as delivered by uh, Mass Global has been working in Helsinki. Uh, an interesting thing about Chris is that she also comes from a background on the government side, having worked with the Finnish Ministry of Transport and Communications, also represented in the room I see, uh, one of the leaders, at least at the national level, in trying to architect what the regulatory infrastructure for mobility as a service might look like. Then we have Karen Van Kloysen. Uh, Karen Van Kloysen is the Secretary General of Polis. Polis is the leading European network of cities and regions focusing on urban transport innovation. And although they are based on Europe, they also bring a lot of insights from around the world and, and within the European space, and especially within the new mobility space, it is one of the platforms where the most engaging and interesting discussions around the development of future mobility takes place. And of course, mobility as a service is a focus of that work. Uh, the Polis, uh, Polis has put out a position paper on mobility as a service and continues to bring in the viewpoints of cities, uh, not just in Europe, but from around the world, on how this mobility as a service ecosystem can best be regulated to ensure that citizens' interests are um, fulfilled. And finally, uh, but not least, we have Timothy Papandreou. He is the founder of City Innovate. He gets the award for being the most jet-lagged today. So we'll keep this. Uh, I'm sure that he will wake up the room rather than falling asleep. Timothy is a key advisor. He is a thought leader on the future of transportation and automation. Uh, he is uh, the found, one of the founders of City Innovate, uh, a smart city accelerator based in San Francisco, but really a global network. Uh, he was also the lead for strategic partnerships at the Way at Waymo, uh, a body that grew out of Google X. Uh, many of you know them as the world's first commercial operator of automated vehicle ride services. Uh, but many of you also know Timothy from his past as chief innovation officer for San Francisco's transportation agency. And there he really helped push the agenda on what the regulatory uh, framework looks like for improved safety, for improved travel options for the people in not just San Francisco, but in the Bay Area. So those are our four speakers, our four discussion leaders. And what we'll talk about today is the issue of what will it take to make mobility as a service more of a reality than it is today. And, and part of that discussion will be to discuss what are the assumptions that we have about what it is that mobility as a service can bring. 
Uh, we've broken this discussion into four areas. I'll speak a little bit in the first area, and then I'm going to ask a question to all of the discussion leaders, and I'll ask the same question to the audience. Um, and then we'll come back to three other questions, each with a increasingly more painful pun. Um, that will be the theme of this session. There is an enduring paradox when we look at our cities, uh, and not just our cities, but a lot of our um, peri-urban areas and rural areas. Uh, but in the heart of our cities, we see uh, a recurrent level of congestion that is, is difficult to live with, in certain cases, uh, unlivable. And at the same time, there is a lot of unused capacity in the system, a lot of empty seats out there, a lot of empty space that's being moved around on wheels. And against this background, this, this paradox of congestion and, and full capacity that has not been used, we have people, you and I, uh, our families, uh, people that we live next to, who just want to get from where they are to where they need to go uh, in a convenient way, in a simple way, in a way that isn't too expensive, and certainly in a way that they can afford. And most importantly, in a way that they can rely on, in a way in which they can plan their day around. So these three things, Limited capacity on networks, excess capacity in vehicles, available capacity, and the desire for some compelling vision or some compelling reality of, of moving around the city in a convenient and affordable way are what is at the heart of this discussion. What is it that Mobility as a Service can deliver to bring these three together, to erase part of the congestion, to reuse some of the capacity, and to make our transport, our daily transport, a much more livable, uh, convivial experience. The first question that we'll ask the audience and our speakers is, what is Mobility as a Service? Uh, and this is one area where, if we can have the uh, presentation. This is uh, one of the areas that I find uh, interesting because there are a number of definitions out there. Uh, there are definitions that are put forward by agencies. There are definitions that are put forward by academics. There are definitions that are put forward by industry groups. Um, and all of them are interesting because they reveal a bit of what each party is interested in, in delivering. Uh, Let's start with uh, the definition from the Mass Alliance, which I think is a fairly concise definition. Mobility as a service is the integration of various forms of transport services into a single mobility service accessible on demand. Now, the reason I've highlighted transport services, because that's one element to keep in mind when we, we think about mobility as a service. Um, there have to be services that should be integrated, and those services are the services that are on the streets of our cities today that require infrastructure, that require capital assets, that require investments, that require regulatory framework. So there is a reality, an existing reality, and a future developing reality that has to be part of the mass ecosystem. And then there are ideas, or there are different ideas on how to actually bring this into a market reality. I won't get into that because I think some of our speakers will, but what I'd like to do is, is share with you one of the most uh, how can I say it, one of the most um, convincing descriptions of what mobility as a service should feel like. And, and it's a horrible analogy, because what uh, Pete Monain from the city of Rent said, mobility as a service, when it actually functions, is like Grand Theft Auto, which is a horrible game. None of you should be playing it. And if your children are playing it, you should probably take away their computer rights. But in this world, you have people being able to go from one mode to the next, usually with the use of a weapon or some force, to get through their day. They never have to think about paying, they never have to think about transferring, they never have to think about travel times, they just move from one to the next, from the tram to the car to the, to the bicycle. There are more bicycles in Grand Theft Auto. That reality of seamless transport in this dysfunctional world is what mass should feel like in a virtuous world, that you can go through the day without having to worry about the transactions that you have to do in order to go from one service to the next in a way that best suits your needs. And one of the things uh, that is important to keep in mind is that the universe of services out there are not, it's a very heterogeneous universe. This is from UITP's most recent report uh, that came out this week on mobility as a service, and it maps out the types of services uh, where they fit in a field of uh, between collective use, it 
in individual use in the upper right hand side and between public access and private access and, and trying to mediate between all these is where mobility as a service fits. How do you bring these together into a simple to use function and that simple to use function is essential because the way in which we access mobility today uh, is each service is mediated directly with the other by the individual through an app, through a, a, a ticket window, through um, subscription services, but there is little coordination between those. Another thing to keep in mind in the mobility as a service ecosystem is that there are a number of sub-functions in there. There's information about trips, availability, routes, there's payment, there's booking, there's ex post, so after the transaction, remediation, if there's a concern about the quality of service. All those are each siloed into each operator's operating systems. The promise of mobility as a service is to actually bring these together into some form of aggregation platform, although I'll, I'll, I'll mention why I hesitated on, on, on platform in a bit, some kind of aggregating function, the mobility as a service function that, that takes all that difficultness in negotiating each element out in, into one um, transaction. The problem with the platforms is that the platforms generate a lot of value to those who hold the platform. And so what you see developing right now is this incipient uh, platform wars, the platform wars. Everyone wants to be the platform. Everyone wants to bring the traffic to their platform and generate some value from that. And there are a number of competing models about what that platform should look like. That platform uh, may uh, take the, and platform I use quite loosely, that platform may take the form of the walled garden. So where a service operator brings all the services into their own ecosystem and then excludes others uh, so that you can very easily within that walled garden get whatever services are available. You can take a bicycle, you can take a ride sourcing car, you can have access to information about public transport. Maybe you can even pay for public transport if there's some kind of agreement, but that is all taking place within a closed ecosystem. There's another model, which is an open mass platform, a platform where all the different operators integrate their information into an open platform organized by who? We'll find out in a second when I ask you the question. Um, and that gives information to the traveler. And the final one, and one that is not very well explored today or not very much discussed about today, is, is a type of aggregating ecosystem, a meshy mass. And this is something that comes out of some of the work that uh, Finland is moving towards. But where can you have a, an ecosystem in which data can speak to data, into which transactions can automatically um, be undertaken without having to go through a single owned platform? What I'd like to point out in all of those is they're missing elements. They're missing elements on the regulatory side, they're missing elements on the infrastructure side, not just on the hard infrastructure, but certainly on the digital infrastructure side. And for example, in this case of Meshy Mass, that whole space, that whole mesh, is actually infrastructure, digital infrastructure that has yet to be built. And so there are some real questions. What is the public role in facilitating one versus another model towards this future? So that is a quick overview of some of the issues involved. And they're not the only issues, but just as some thinking elements to uh, start this discussion on what is mobility as a service. So I'm going to ask each of you to answer that question. In your view, what are the most important elements of mobility as a service? And what are those elements that maybe have been talked about a lot, but maybe less important for you? And for that, I'll ask, drum roll. I'll ask Karen Van Kloysen, please, to, to start. Okay, thanks, Philippe. Hi, everyone. Um, well, you, you already said what it is, so. <laughs> Do you agree with any of those? I do agree. Um, when we talk a lot about mass, uh, it's, it's, a, it's a hot topic. Um, when, when you also mentioned that you were going to ask this question, because you're not taking us by surprise, <laughs> you, um, you were talking about concept, a product, an ecosystem, and, and a service. And I think it's interesting to look at it from, from that perspective, because we talk about it, but it's still very much a concept today. Even though there's a big buzz around it, when it comes to the actual deployment of mass, we're not uh, that far advanced, so it's, it's still limited. Um, and then depending on, on the di direction in which it develops, it could become a product, which is not what I would like to see happening, uh, meaning that if it would be a purely commercial 
uh, commodity. Um, it should be a service indeed, and, and this integration dimension is, is important. A service in the sense that it's serving the user, it's user-centric, another word that keeps coming up all the time. And then ideally, when it's uh, finally there, it will be an ecosystem, bringing all these uh, key stakeholders and, and different elements that you were mentioning in, in your slides uh, together into an integrated um, system. And um, coming back to the user centricity and, and speaking from the perspective of, of cities and regions, um, that's where I think it's important to point out, and this will come back when we discuss on who should take the lead or who should play which role, that this user centricity should be complemented with what is good for society as a whole, which might not necessarily align with the individual um, wishes, needs uh, of, of, of the user as such. We want to make it easy, of course, for the user to travel and, and we want seamless journeys and that's also what cities want, but they have other concerns to take into account and that will be central to the discussion which modes are actually being prioritized through such an integrated system. And I think that's uh, an essential element of the... And maybe even the tools that we use to prioritize this. Absolutely. Krista, um, so for Karen, it's, it's long-term more of an ecosystem. You actually have a product on the market, um, but you also, when, when you talk, you um, generally, the, the company talk about mobility as a service, you also have this view of an open ecosystem. So for you, um, what does Mass look like? What is Mass for, for women for Mass Global? First of all, I thank you for the ideas from Grand Theft Auto. I think I'm going to go back and now say that we should definitely start including the weapons in our, in our service offering. Um, I think that there's two different ways that I normally describe what Mars is. So the simple way and also what we as a company, Mars Global or WEM, our service does, it's indeed it's a service that covers all of your mobility needs. The day-to-day -day stuff, but also then when you need to go on a WEM. Um, and it really all boils down to also that we give you a promise that we will get you there, that we will cover all of your needs. That's when we can start getting closer and closer and actually go beyond giving you a better service level than your own car. So that's what we want to do. And this is kind of from a mass operator point of view to the end user. But obviously that's kind of simplistic. Then comes the more complex thing, and which I normally like to um, describe as an awesome heavy metal band. <laughs> so in the band, you normally, you always, you have the axe man. So this is the lead guitarist. That is all of the different new mobility services that you need to have there. Those ones that can kind of cover those white spaces that we have in the offering at the moment. Then, but you also need those heavy beats. I mean, I'm a massive, massive sucker <laughs> for blast beat drumming. For drummers, that's obviously public transport. Public transport will always have to be there to do the heavy lifting or heavy beating. Then, there's always that one that is quite often kind of disregarded. Try listening to Iron Maiden without the bass. Bass or the bassist, that's the regulator. Because you will obviously also have to have regulation, setting the right type of framework so that we can actually have what Karen was just talking about, that we also have a whole ecosystem or a transport system 2.0 that will deliver societal good. But then we go to the user centrism. And that's also, that's where the lead man or woman comes in. And that's basically the mass operator. Because who are you doing this for? Who is the key that we can actually have those changes? That's the audience. So you normally, you need that lead woman, so the mass operator, that basically entices all of you makes those tricks, whether it's waving your hips or screaming out loud or growling like I like, like it, <laughs> to lure you in and make you fall in love with the service. But basically, this ain't a trio. This definitely isn't a duo. But you need the whole band together. And you might have gathered that I am a metalhead myself. <laughs> um, but some of you might not be. You know, I, I think that you're wrong, but I accept <laughs> it. So it also means that there has to be different type of bands. Because there are different type of people that like different type of music. The same applies to Mars. 
So you have to have different type of bands and different type of mass operators that we can actually tap into everybody's different needs. So uh, puns and now band analogies or musical analogies. Paolo, what are you going to contribute to the, your view of the definition of mobility as a service? Yeah. For, uh, for me, I, I see it as a, a really an open ecosystem. Uh, I really see it as a, that's the way it needs to, to be done. But uh, I think that uh, for me, the, the definition is still a bit not solidified. Um, because uh, I also believe that uh, it needs to be just a bit more than just mobility, in the sense it needs to be the for mobility of people and, for instance, and goods. Um, I think that uh, we need to understand that it will play a role in an ecosystem, and that ecosystem needs to be open. And I think uh, we are finding things that uh, we never thought was possible to optimize with mobility as a service. And I think that uh, that is something that we need to take in consideration when we have a, a definition. But for sure, it's more than just uh, uh, the user centricity. It's also how do we define how the city moves. So the city has different, uh, has kind of a, like a, we call it a, a heartbeat. And the city changes throughout the day. And it might be that in the morning you have the requirement to take people as quickly or as efficiently as possible from A to B with a user centricity point of view. But might be that um, in the off-peak period, you might try to entice people, for instance, to have a more environmentally friendly or more energy efficient way of traveling. That needs to be taken in consideration in, uh, in mobility as a service. And yes, they, they, they are very um, integrated, and integration is, is a very good thing. But we need to think, as, as Karen mentioned, the, the benefit for the society and how that is going to be optimized and done. And, and that's the thing that for me it's, it's really uh, interesting in mobility as a service is, is the opportunities it brings are incredible and uh, therefore uh, it becomes very difficult to have a solid definition today because that definition for me it's kind of moving almost every day. Yes, it is crystallizing, it's getting closer to it, but uh, as I said, because we have not really seen all the benefits, we have not invested in understanding everything, it's still uh, a movable feast on that sense. Timothy, okay, we see, we see there's a lot of, uh, I mean, there's some convergence around what mobility as a service is, but maybe, maybe we're overplaying the need to have a definition of mobility as a service. And, and I can see a reason for having one, which is mobility as a service as a regulatory object. So governments, if they have to interact, have to have something they can identify. Um, but maybe, maybe that's not the case right now. What do you think mobility as a service is? And, and is it necessary to have a definition at this stage? Yeah, it's, a, uh, it's an interesting question. Um, thank you for inviting me for being here. Um, I'm going to rewind us back to 2010, when I was uh, actually two years into the, the role in the uh, city of San Francisco. We actually have slides that show what mobility as a service uh, was. And a lot of people think that it's a couple of years old, but we've been talking about it since 2009 and 10 in San Francisco. And I have this slide that has all these different services all these different smart cards, because back then you needed a smart card for car sharing, you needed one for bike sharing, you needed one for, for taking public transport, you needed, a, you needed a smart card for all these things. We had all these smart cards making a really dumb wallet, right? Because we have to stick all these smart cards in our wallet, and there's no room left for our credit card or for anything else. So we were like, that's really silly. We should, we should easily be able to use this thing called apps that had just started popping up, and we could stitch it all together. But it's eight, nine years later, and we're still not there, you know, except for, for these guys doing a great job. And it's still a concept because we're not willing to do the stitching work that's required mm -hmm. to fix all this together. The reason why we don't have global mass everywhere is because there's so much work on the back end to stitch it all together. I don't think anybody who is not a transit operator or some sort of mobility operator can understand how much work is involved, but it's not impossible it just hasn't been incentivized to be done. So yeah, so the, the definition of mass is the ability to route, book, and pay and get from A to B, C, D, and E. But that's the beginning, mm -hmm. you know? And to me, the definition is less important to actually just doing it. We need to start actually doing it and get it done. And the biggest piece of mass is public transport. They're also the least incentivized, I should say, or the least interested in integrating and interconnecting with all the different systems so we can actually have that system. So what's happening on the reverse side is, 
you're getting all these uh, new mobility companies who are saying, I can stitch it with you all, so bike share, scooter, car share, ride hailing, Uber, Lyft, et cetera, except public transport. And that's the holy grail of mass. Without that, mass doesn't work. So you have mini, mini mass, and then <laughs> big PT just going, well, I'm not sure. Do I have control? Do I have access? Who does the back-end payment? Who's going to pay for this sort of stuff? You know, all of these services have one or two payment um, options. Some public transport agents have 30 different payment uh, prices, whether you're older, younger, et cetera. So there's a lot of back-end stuff mm -hmm. that needs to be done. And we need to, I think we need to take a bit of a deep breath, step back and saying, what does the customer actually need to do to get from A to B? And then what are the regional outcomes? Because to me, the definition is a little weak in that, for what? Mm -hmm. So if, if we can all bounce around really easily on scooters, on bike share, on car share, ride share, for what? Mm -hmm. Is it to achieve certain outcomes that the region wants? Is it to achieve certain emissions and other big factors? Like what, what is the reason for it? Yeah. Right now it's for convenience because it's so inconvenient what we have right now. But you know, there's a reason why we have 90% of people in some regions driving around every all the time because mass is their keys. They just start yep. the car and go. And for you to do everything else, you need a PhD in integrated economics to figure out how to get around. And that's ridiculous. You have to understand a map. You have to understand how to use apps. You have to understand how to use prices, timetables. We're asking a little bit too much of people to just switch like mm -hmm. that. And mm -hmm. I think we need to have a bit of a reality check on it. I, I, you, you highlight two things that are, I think are really important that we'll come back to. One is, is the stitching. And, and the stitching is, is, of course, the key element in delivering mobility as a service, as, as we discussed in the various uh, definitions and certainly in the ecosystem approach. But maybe um, you, you touch on this other issue, which is maybe we don't even have the right marketplace. We don't have the right market structure for mobility as a service to handle um, uh, the allocation of revenues among different operators using a new model on a click model, on a transaction model versus a ticket model. So we'll come back to that in a second. I'd like to, to turn to the audience. Um, how many of you, just raise your hands, uh, would feel confident that you know mass when you see it? Zero people. Three? Three? Raise them high. So there are three people in the room who feel they would know mobility as a service if it bit them in the butt. <laughs> All right, that's not a resounding, that's not a resounding, um, it's good feedback. All right, um, that, uh, the next question is irrelevant now because I was going to ask you how many of you saw it this week? Uh, but I suspect that none of you did. So um, this raises a, uh, an issue, and we'll touch on this before we go to the next one. Um, we've heard a lot about user centricity in mobility as a service. Uh, and Tim said, well, we have user centricity in the existing system dominant system in many places, not every place, but many places in the world, which is the user uses an individual vehicle to get around as they want, either walking, cycling, or using a car. Where in the discussion around mobility as a service, which focuses on users, are users saying, we want this service? Um, it, it's a interesting um, misalignment, if you will, that we talk a lot about user centricity uh, from our side, you know, from the, those that are interested in mobility as a service, and yet there aren't people clamoring out there saying, I want mass and I want it today, and this is what it's going to look like, and this is how I want it. Uh, except, perhapsably, in, in Helsinki, I'm going to go back to, to Krista on this. When you get feedback from your users, um, when they Inter, inter, when they purchase your services, purchase your subscriptions, uh, it's oftentimes the first time they're experiencing something specifically like what you're offering, integrated package. Are they asking for it before they come in, or is it something that you have to do a lot of marketing for? They freaking love it. Um, <laughs> I think that there's, there's a few different factors. Obviously, it depends um, what the situation is in any given market. You know, obviously in Finland, for example, we'd been talking about mass uh, for a long time and also the regulative framework that was set in place, obviously that also was in the media and stuff. So obviously for a company like us, that was also uh, was helping out. Um, but we've also, we've done several, several market studies across the world. And basically when you, when you give it out, when you lay it out in a simplistic terms, what we would be offering, most people say, yes, absolutely, why isn't it here already? Mm -hmm. So I think that there's, there's, this, there's 
huge demand for it. And in most places, people are kind of ready for a, um, for a change or an option. But now the bit less simplistic thing, and I think that this also comes back to what Tim was talking about, is that when, for example, when we provide this through an app, every single click, even one extra click, one extra piece of information you ask from people, they drop off. And I think that this is now bringing in, bridging in the old and the new world that we have, for example, different service providers in the sector that are not custom yet to the, to the digital world and in particular to the to digital end user world. And for example, when we're looking at our funnel with people signing up, it's, it is in big numbers that are completely aligned with the whole app uh, industry. But as soon as you ask for one more detail, for example, somebody's email address, somebody's phone number, when we go to public transport tickets, quite often we have to be asking then, in, indeed, if it's, for example, uh, concession tickets, there has to be, for example, your age. Once again, people go like, ugh. Yeah, not going to do it. It's too much bother. Mm -hmm. So this is also something that we have to be competitive in when we are competing with the car. Because the car is also, it's there. But at the same time, the demand is coming. Um, and I think that it's the other thing that, that's, that's kind of our advantage um, as a private operator, as well as that's that's our challenges is finding the different ways. Like, okay, we know these hurdles. We know how particular people are. What are the different ways how we can entice them and incentivize them to still get on? Mm -hmm. And I think that here, our, for example, our, our palette or our menu, how to lure them in to using all the other services instead of their own car is far, far greater than what the public sector has. I think, I think there's an element in that, which is the infrastructure for the existing system is, is already there. And so you have to compete in a system that isn't actually physically set up for the, the ecosystem that we're discussing. And I think there's a really important point that Krista just made, and I'm going to reiterate it, because it's, it's something that has been in the back of my mind, but you've really pointed it out. We tend to think about the barriers to seamless travel as being big blocks of government action, of misalignment between private actors. But in fact, what you're telling us is the barriers are really micro-sized. They're at the level of one click, and if you lose 30% of the people you're engaged with with one additional click, that's the barrier that counts, because you're not going to get those Matt. So that's that's a really important insight. Paolo, you wanted to say something, and then uh, Karen. I, I wanted to, to to add a couple of things to, to what has been said. So I, I think it's uh, it's difficult to to address the single use private car um, because if you ask them what they want, they will just tell you they want more car parking. Mm -hmm. It's the same as uh, Henry Ford said. If you ask people what they wanted a uh, hundred years ago, they would tell you they wanted faster horses, not cars. And I think it's it's kind of the same situation where we have to, to, to give them the experience that mobility as a service is good and is economically better off. In the end, it's about money as well. And if we can really demonstrate that, that is something that, uh, that really is, uh, is important. I mean, uh, you know, Philip, that uh, uh, in the city of Lisbon, uh, there's been a lot of things done uh, for mobility as a service. And the latest one they've done, which uh, started in first of April this year, was to reduce the price of public transport. And that was really uh, with the operators and to a maximum of 30 euros per month, exactly because they realized as a family of four, that's still 120 euros a month, but now it's cheaper than, uh, than owning a car. And that's a transformation that we need. And I, I would disagree a little bit that the, the public transport operators are not on board. I think they are on board and they realize that they have to do it. And it's very clear that mobility as a service will only operate when you have a spinal cord or, uh, in the city, which is high capacity public transport. There's no other way that will work. And that is a very important to understand that that is the success of a mobility as a service is depending on the high capacity public transport. Absolutely. Karen, you had... Um, coming back to what you said is, were the users asking for this? I mean, of course, they, it's hard to be against it if you offer this convenience and integrated packages which make it easy to switch between modes. So I think, 
of course, once it's there, uh, I think people would be interested in having it. At the same time, I think it's naive to, and, and it's too often assumed that this alone will lead to a change in travel behavior. Um, uh, because in, in many of the mass um, narratives, it just simply s states that mass is going to lead to a, a model shift in favor of, of sustainable modes and that the user will adapt his behavior if you offer this integrated package. And I don't think that's a given. Mm -hmm. We all hope it's going to happen, but it's not just going to happen like that. And, and mass cannot do it alone. Uh, what you need is, first of all, good quality services to be in place, because what you're integrating needs to be of good quality. And as you say, public transport is, is, is the backbone of that, but also other measures where cities are playing a key role, where they disincentivize car trips, where they give priority over um, to sustainable modes through good infrastructure for active travel through interchanges and hubs, through good parking management, tra traffic calming, and so on. So it's, it's, MAS is a package of measures, but it's also part of a bigger package of, of even more measures. And only then, I think, we can assume that travel behavior might be happening, hopefully. Can, can I, uh, before we continue, ask the audience, how many of you feel confident that were the thing that you don't see right now, mobility as a service, uh, based on your last question, were that to exist, how confident would you be that it would change travel behavior um, from the dominant modes that you see in your cities today? So if there was an integrated package that allowed you to move seamlessly from uh, a multitude of different services, possibly all the services that are offered in the city, do you feel that would be sufficient to change travel behavior? So the answer for those who agree, do you think, let's see the hands. And for those of you who think that's insufficient, please raise your hands. So slightly more optimist than pessimist. Yeah. Yeah. It would help if we knew exactly, if we actually experienced it, that's one thing. I'm going to, to move to the next topic, but and then I'm going to ask Tim to start with the discussion on that. Uh, and that is an appropriate topic for you. Timothy, who should be the master of mobility as a service? Uh, who is it that should be in the driver's seat? Now, one thing I, I want to, to point out that maybe the person in the driver's seat isn't necessarily the one providing all the services. So, but in your view, Tim, uh, who should be the orchestrator? Yeah, so I've been, we've been looking at this for many years now and looked at different models. And uh, I believe it's a it does come down to the governance piece of it. Governance is going to be very, very important. It's actually critical. And I think that just to dovetail on the previous question, without a region or a city government or some sort of, of uh, governing uh, entity, uh, it's going to be very difficult because there is no uh, outcome. What is the outcome? The outcome without a governance structure is profit at all costs. And people will be moved to the highest price service regardless of its impact on the transport system. So governance is really critical. Who does the governance, whether it's the national, provincial, state, or region, or local, I think is going to be depending on, on the region, the size of the region. Like Tokyo is a huge government. Some cities in the US are only one or two square kilometers. So it's, that's probably not the right, right level, but there is a, a regional type governance level. But it has to be based on some guardrails, some pretty clear outcomes, and some pretty clear uh, uh, assumptions and expectations, and then work with those mobility providers to actually get to those goals. Um, I think it's important to note as well that we don't have a level playing field. So mass could actually make things worse if we don't course correct for the, some of the things that we haven't put in place. Like we haven't priced our roads appropriately. We haven't priced our parking appropriately. We haven't priced our transport system since 1939, frankly. It's, well, after World War II, we just took economics out of transport and made it completely devoid of logic. So we have to bring that back. And these new mobility companies are kind of bringing that in, saying, well, this is how much it actually really costs. So we have to, we have, to have a, a full cost accounting of the system, which would be a governance issue, an understanding of what are the minimum guardrails we want in this governance structure, what are the key outcomes. They'll vary by region. Some will be much more focused on safety. Others will be focused much more on equity. Some will be focused on interoperability. It just depends what infrastructure you have. And I think having that level playing field will then allow these companies like the aggregators or the other different service providers to actually really optimize in that space. But without that, without that sand pit or that, that guardrail structure, it's a very free-for-all system which does result in the walled gardens issue that you talked about. And it results in the, the haves and the have-nots. And so I think it's just really important that cities or regions 
take a step back and ask, what do we actually want to achieve with this? What are the outcomes? And how do we get there? Too often we have restrictive and regulatory uh, re uh, reactions to things, rather than a permissive and performance-based partnership, which is let's work together. We don't have all the answers. You don't have all the answers. But together, we know how we want our region to look like, and let's work together on that. And to me, that's really the who should own it. Um, I don't know if there's an owner or one owner, but there's a definite governance structure. Yeah, maybe maybe ownership is the, the wrong word, but guidance. You know, who, yeah. who is the orchestrator or orchestrator yeah. who guides this? Yeah. Uh, Krista, in, in your experience, uh, you've been active in Helsinki and a few other cities. Um, where do you feel comfortable having guidance? Um, do you like to guide or do you like to be guided? This is... <laughs> Trust me. Um, <laughs> I think that still going back to that, you know, who should own it, um, I think this whole master of puppets question does come along constantly. Um, and I see, I, what, I see what you did there. Good, good. <laughs> um, and I, I personally, I think that it's, it, it's not maybe happening out in the open quite so much anymore, but it's still, who owns it? And I think that as a sector in these days, I think it's sad. I, it, it, seriously, it's bloody sad that we're talking about who should own it. I mean, it's, the, it's kind of like we'd be talking about, if you think how essential mobility is for the individuals, for the societies, even for our economies, that they're still regional as well as global players that are talking about that they should own the whole thing. It's, it's kind of who would out in the open now talk about that, that who owns and we will own the internet. And I think that the, also the whole telecom sector and the internet also kind of plays like a nice analogy how this thing will play out. I think that the, it's, we can now see that there's a few different ways if the whole mass sector is developing. And it is indeed this... Um, World gardens, very siloed approaches uh, are happening. And I would say that this is particularly an approach that is coming from the US. Mm -hmm. Then we have the public transport takes it all. So in particular, again, in, uh, well, I would say primarily in Europe, we can see this, that the public transport, the public sector would like to own it all. And then we have the open ecosystem. And I would, that's also one of the things that why I found it so easy to jump from the government to go and work for this particular company because we really, really, truly believe in it. And we actually believe in it in the sense that we also think for this to succeed, there can't be just one of us. Mm -hmm. There has to be several mass operators so that the people in the end, that they feel that they can trust that there's choice. They're not stuck with somebody, just one that out there. But then if we go back to the um, whole idea of how the telecoms and the internet section, uh, sector has developed, if you think of it, for example, in Finland, and relating to the guidance and governance, that's definitely open ecosystem doesn't mean that there wouldn't be a significant role for that, because there will have to be. For example, in Finland, yes, a tiny country, still, we have the highest use of mobile data in the world. We also have the whole sector was basically deregulated, not deregulated, but liberalized, open for competition in the 90s. And we now have competition. We also have some of the lowest prices and the best access to mobile networks in the world. Whilst at the same time, for example, the mobile uh, operators, they are obliged to offer their networks also in places that normally wouldn't be commercially interesting or viable for them. Mm -hmm. Then if you go and look at the US, for example, where the situation is quite different, what's happening to net neutrality there? Mm -hmm. And I think it's that type of questions that we really have to be asking now. Like, how do we want this to play out? Because people's physical mobility is very, very crucial, and it's the time to make that decision is pretty much now. So, I mean, the model that you're advocating, uh, which I think is a compelling one, is the master of none model, which is you have an open system where people can integrate uh, along the lines of the original thinking around the internet, which 
okay, has come a long way and in some ways is, is receding in certain areas. But having a mass neutral system is, is a bit what you're describing. We don't have the architecture for that yet outside of Finland. Uh, and even in Finland, there are parts of the architecture that still have to be built into place. So in order to, to move towards that, we'll come back to this. Uh, we have to think about perhaps some of the building blocks that will be necessary to build a mass neutral architecture um, that allows these operators to work together. Uh, Paolo, I, I'm going to ask you a, a question um, that's related to this. The UITP just put out uh, a really, really good report on mobility as a service uh, coming f uh, ahead of their uh, World uh, Congress. And one of the things they point out is, of course, their preference uh, as the organization of public transport operators is that uh, the model where the public transport operator uh, as the aggregator, as the anchor, um, is the right one. We've said, and you said earlier, that public transport is the anchor of the mass ecosystem. Um, does that mean that the public transport operator or authority should be the anchor of the mass governance system? Honestly, no, from my point of view. And this is why I also said that, uh, um, that to me, the idea of mass is still crystallizing. And uh, an easy example is to, to understand that uh, Mobility as a service is not necessarily what we only see today. There's a lot more things that will come along. So, for instance, we are heavily involved with a lot of uh, 3D or vertical mobility. So, what is the role of a vertical mobility in a mass ecosystem? Is it public transport? Is it a luxury transport? What role does it play? And yes, we can set up a kind of a PPEs, so uh, PPP, so public transport partnerships, yes, and you can define some KPIs or performance indicators that the city in partnership can do it. But I like your analogy, it needs to be a bit like the internet because we don't know today what will come in the future. And so we need to have that openness in whatever we do. So to anchor ourselves today, I think is wrong. Mm -hmm. And uh, we need to, to understand that we need to leave it quite open. And we can see that, uh, for instance, just to give you an example, the vertical mobility, yes, uh, I think it was uh, two or three years ago that they couldn't even fly a drone here in, in Leipzig. And you go to other countries and not they don't care, but they're much more open. So businesses and new ideas and new concepts are being explored uh, all around the world in, in a different way. Mm -hmm. And they are implemented in a different way. And I think um, one of the things I, I, I realized, and uh, I was talking about it before, just before we started, we underestimate, for instance, how some countries or in cities around the world are becoming references on particular topics. And we still, oh, it's because it's, uh, for instance, the example I give is in, uh, in South America with this uh, electric scooters. They have thousands and thousands of it. They do it well. Mm -hmm. So why is it so difficult for us in the more developed world to accept that element? And so there's loads of different lessons uh, that are being uh, experimented around the world, and we need to, to get that those lessons. And they come from times from the most unexpected uh, locations, and that's the richness of uh, mobility as a service as it is today. Is it, it is different, it is customizable, but you can learn from the different experiences to try to fit your situation. So I think it's very dangerous as well that we need to have uh, a master purpose uh, trying to, to get things because yes, the city has to have some control and it has to be an important partner, but so do all the others. And even in regulation in terms of prices, in terms of uh, safety, in terms of uh, efficiency and so on. Sustainability, of course. But the, as I said, it depends how we want to manage our systems and, uh, and cities. So what is the objective of what we're trying to do? And how does that objective change? And it changes every minute. There is there's a playing field uh, for all of this. Uh, in urban areas, the playing field is the city. Do you feel that cities are ready for the mass if internet? <laughs> <laughs> Some cities may be ready, others might not uh, yet or will never be. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I think um, 
There is not one single model that is university applicable, and there will never be. So it might be different um, depending on the local situation, the local context, uh, the existing services in place, and their quality, the level of integration that are, is already out there. Some cities do have already quite high level of integration in terms of different services and are quite advanced in that. But also the local skills, are they able to take up a leading role or not at all? Um, and, and coming back to your issue of ownership, I, I, I fully agree and, and understand what you're saying but ownership is one thing but oversight is another thing and that's what you were saying I, I think is, is instrumental in that respect that there is a need for public sector oversight what uh, shape that takes is, is another question um, but we have to make sure that certain policy goals are respected that the right modes as I mentioned before are um, uh, being prioritized that it's an equitable and socially inclusive system as well where it's not a situation where those that have the money can have a very uh, in, uh, interesting premium package and others that might not have uh, those advantages uh, get the crappy services. Um, and, and looking at the reality today where the lines between public and private are blurring um, when it comes to mobility services and it's not just the city or the transport authority anymore delivering those services, I think that the, the best model is, is going to be a hybrid model where it's a combination of responsibilities and, and each player is doing what it is best at. And, and that's a combination of, of um, public policy goals with um, very good technological skills or integration skills, you know, looking at the different um, players that, that are, should be part of this ecosystem. And in that sense, I, I quite like the, the Vienna model where, mm -hmm. where um, um, the public sector has, has put in place this kind of uh, technical integration level, the, the, the data platform, which allows different mass operators to, to tap into that and, and, and then put out their um, different services. So it will be hybrid, I think. Let's, let's talk scaling up. I'll start with you, Tim. Uh, scaling up, what will it take to get to massive mass? The, the, we've hit on a number of, of topics here. Um, and, and Tim, I'll ask you to start off because you had something you wanted to add to this last one. Um, but I want to put out there that maybe one of the most difficult issues to deal with, and, and Chris, you can confirm this uh, if this is your experience, is the allocation of revenue among multiple operators in a new type of ecosystem when operators were used to having single revenue streams. So negotiating the money seems to be the money is always, it's very important, it's also a, a very difficult negotiation. Uh, that may be one of the barriers to getting up to large scale mobility as a service. But Tim, what is your view on what will it take to get to much more massive uptake of mobility as a service? Yeah, I think it's a, I think it's a fundamental question of, of uh, how much we're willing to actually work together and cooperate. Um, I found that in regions in the world that cooperate with the public sector, the private sector, and the community sectors actually cooperate with each other. And cooperate doesn't mean control. It means to actually cooperate. There's a lot more outcomes that, that happen versus those that don't. And for it to scale, you know, we have the back-end infrastructure that it needs to be absolutely done. There has to be at least one, a sort of an account, some sort of regional or, or a sub, sub-national account that can be the place where the, the, these interactions can happen. You also need some sort of uh, marketplace, whether it's, an, whether it's a cloud-based marketplace or some sort of marketplace where we can put in prices, programs, processes, et cetera, that can basically be bounced off of and, and connected to. And I think is, I'm always going to go back to the governance. Without the governance saying that you will have interoperability, interoperability looks like this. These APIs must be open and deep linked, and it looks like this. And it's going to be very difficult to scale that sort of stuff. Also on the, the pricing, it's very difficult to ask somebody who is already paying for a car to now pay the same or similar price or even less again for the package. It's very, that's a very challenging question. And again, it's like, what is the government's role in all of mobility and transportation? And if they're not willing to accept that we have a current inequitable system and that we're not doing it well today, it's gonna be very hard to push ourselves over the other side. So governments in general have to take a bit of a step back and say, what are we doing really well? Let's do that better. And what are we doing really poorly? And let it go. Mm -hmm. Like anybody that Marie Kondo, the art of, of decluttering your house, if it doesn't give you joy, let it go. Like, you know, let it go. Stop doing things that don't give you joy. <laughs> and that's where these smaller micro mobility companies are doing really well because they're bringing joy back in mobility. It's very hard for someone to say, driving gives me joy, or riding a bus or a train gives me joy. But when they ride a bicycle 
or a scooter, it feels joyful. So we need to think that's what's going to scale is to bring back that human emotion, that human element to it, and being really customer centric about it, like really understanding why people get around and what is the right way to get around depending on where you are and, and where you're not. So in some situations, it's sunny outside, it's only two kilometers to a train station. It makes perfect sense if I'm able-bodied to take a bicycle or a scooter and connect the PT. But if I'm not able-bodied, I can't do it. Mm -hmm. And so the scaling question is not just about the infrastructure and the services, but do we actually even understand our community that we're in? And, and what assets do we actually have, both social assets and physical assets? So I think that's really the, the key piece in the scaling side. The tech stuff is actually really easy. Yeah. Just stitch it all together, bang it up, connect it and go. But that's actually not the hard part. The hard part is, what does the governance actually want to make this actually work so it actually does work as one system? So I'm going to follow up on that because I think it's, it's a brilliant analogy that we need to marry condo our cities. But, but. Um, in order to do that, there are some insurmountable blocks that cannot be addressed at the city level. So you're talking about governance, and I'm going to go back to, to Karen. Um, what are the different kind of roles of government at the national level, at the regional level, uh, and at the local level that may be, uh, or actions of governments that may be blocking um, the upscaling of abilities of service? Uh, are there procurement rules, for example, that may be difficult that are set at the national level that won't allow services to be procured in the way in which uh, would support a mass ecosystem? In the experience of your cities, how much freedom do they have to innovate within national rules that are set uh, outside of their boundaries? Well, it depends on the country, but what, what our cities are currently um, trying to get their head around is, is how to, first of all, regulate the individual new mobility services that have been coming to the market. Integration is then the next step. So the, the e-scooter companies, the, the bike shares and so on, how to regulate for that. And then that's where they sometimes hit the wall because they don't have the competence um, uh, to do so. Um, for example, when it comes to licensing, if, if, if licenses to Uber type services, ride, ride sourcing services are given on the national level, it's very difficult for the local level to put um, additional instruments in place and, and that, that give them leverage, you know. Um, it, it's uh, the case in Amsterdam, for example, where they're struggling with a number of challenges related to ride hailing, but where the licensing is, is, is on the national level. So they, and, and they're not aligned also locally and nationally in terms of uh, what needs to be done to to mitigate these negative effects. So that's one example. Another example is that, that in some countries, um, cities do not have uh, the authority to remove um, vehicles from public space. Like in the case of, of scooter companies, if, if they don't comply with certain rules, um, many cities can say, we just remove them from, from the streets and that's it, your story is over. But if you don't have that instrument in your hands, because uh, it's with the national level to decide these things, then it's a problem. Or if scooters are not allowed at all, and you're quite open and keen as a city to allow them on your roads, but nationally legislation still needs to be adapted, then it's holding you back. So there are a number of issues definitely to, to be resolved in that respect. And that's first of all with the individual services, and then when it comes to integration as the next step. I suspect in Finland, and I'm going to ask you to, to put on your last cap, which was uh, as a member of, of the Finnish uh, Ministry of Transport, when it came to the discussion about how do we re-regulate the sector, um, the mobility sector, uh, were there discussions on incremental changes? We can fix this, we can fix that. Uh, but what led to the discussion that we need to rewrite it all? We need to reformulate Tabrahas, uh, our whole mobility law, in order to support the outcomes that we want. Um, can you give some insights from, from that discussion that took place within Finland? At what point was it obvious to you that you had to do the Big Bang? First of all, I think that the, the, all the glory should be going for some amazing people that we had in the in the government and in the ministry at that time like some severely amazing women especially also <laughs> also guys but amazing women that were really really uh, for thinking very early on and i think that the uh, one of the first things that it kind of all kind of started unraveling from is that you know um uh, basically the service levels are going down the service, services are actually getting uh, more costly, as well as the infrastructure is getting worse and worse, and yet again, we have less and less money. So how 
are we supposed to, at the same time, to tap into all of the different transport policy goals, like having affordable, smooth transport connections for everybody, as well as get our emissions down, get transport safety on a better level. And if you look at those in the, in the kind of, uh, in the, the old school way, those four would actually seem like they are in a contradiction. So I think that the people in the ministry at that point started like, we, we need to overthink it or completely rethink this. Mm -hmm. And I think that it came from that. But now the, the beauty um, that what we did with the legislative reform, um, because obviously we were also at that stage that was now in, in about 2015 or so when we started the work, um, was that it was still very, very hazy. At that point, yes, we had Ubers and Lyfts, not even in Finland, but there was no e-scooters. But at the same time, we knew that there's going to be like a bucket load of different type of new services popping up. How do you regulate for that? And so we didn't want to do the cat and mouse chase, but had to figure out some other way of doing it. And I mean, it was, it was acknowledging that it's like when you regulate, that it's like a devil in the midnight mass. Um, I think you're going to be winning this proposition. I know, I know, I'm slightly competitive. Um, so, how do you go about it? And it was basically nicking off the, off the British what they did with their regulative reform in, uh, in the UK. It's taking the zero-based uh, zero review mm -hmm. and actually regulating purely from the end-user perspective. Mm -hmm. Get rid of, imagine a situation, there's no regulation. And then by regulation by regulation and degree by degree, start debating, do we still need this? And not from the government point of view, not from the, not from the new or the existing transport stakeholders, but the end user. Mm -hmm. Does the end user actually need us to regulate this? And that basically, exactly, wait, there was Marie Kondo. They, she wasn't around in Finland at the moment, but you know, I feel in like spirit, the spirit, in spirit must have been. There. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we, we Marie kondo the hell out of uh, the regulations in Finland at that point. Um, and indeed, that's how we got into that you deregulate, you give more room for innovation, but at the same time, you also introduce new regulation. Mm -hmm. So that you have, through data, mandating access to APIs, you create a level playing field, but you also create a situation where the, uh, where the public sector has more tools, far more accurate tools, far more actual data and information in what state and how is the market performing and what it is delivering. I think... Uh I'll, I'll ask the audience at this moment, how, how many of you uh, feel that uh, this approach, the sort of uh, uh, starting at level zero again, is something you feel confident your country, the country in which you live, uh, would engage? Rethinking the entire mobility law in your country. How many of you uh, feel that is something that your country would do? So we have one. Are you not finished, are you? <laughs> All right, and how many f of you feel that that would be something helpful um, for your country to do? Okay, that's, that's an important message to bring to um, some of, the, of you that are in this audience and many of you that are at this summit, that there is a mismatch between what some people feel is necessary and what many people feel is probable in this space. And I think one of the things we can see is that absent level work, that type of work, heavy lifting being done at the national level, a lot of cities are doing it. Um, you can see different iterations of, of what Finland has done in uh, different cities, uh, Los Angeles with their development of the mobility data specification that they They've pushed out to other cities. There are problems with the way in which some of these are taking place, and there are real problems with the way in which some of these are not being applied equally. Um, but that's something to keep in mind. Paolo, did, did you have anything to say about, from your view, what is it that would be helpful to help upscale uh, mobility as a service? Yeah, I, I like very much what Tim was saying, but I also have a comment on it because uh, um, I, 
we as SPTV and Bellingham, some of the work we did at the CPB with the Lisbon study and then Curbs Access and all these things. Also from, uh, we work a lot with the uh, OEMs mm -hmm. and we are trying to help them to understand how they enter some of these uh, new markets. And you have to, to realize that for them, it's not always easy. And this discussion illustrates that. But uh, um, one of the things we, we find out with a number of studies that, that we've done is the great majority of, of the things that we've done is that uh, in order to run a mobility as a service uh, in a city, uh, with, so we calculate the ideal fleet size, right? And with that uh, fleet size, we realize that with 50% of that fleet, you serve 80% of the demand. And the rest, the remaining 50%, are only there to serve 20%, so, which is very inefficient. And so they, they realize that, honestly, they need to be the first one to the poll. Because if they are, they capture the market. And, uh, but when you see the changes that are happening in cities, and for instance, the curb uh, access is an easy one, so if you regulate the curb size, maybe we need to uh, al allow people to enter and exit the vehicles in a much faster way. So that we need eight door vehicles or whatever it is. So that is very difficult for them. So they want to try to be the first ones to the market in order to make the pricing and the businesses, the business model work. And then at the same time, the city is saying, oh, I don't, I don't really know, but uh, yeah, go with this, but tomorrow we might, we might change. Of course it's difficult. But I think that uh, there is a much more openness from the private side uh, and some, some of the operators in having those discussions with cities. And I, I honestly believe that pricing is not a topic. Mm -hmm. It's never a topic. It's not, oh, your service is too expensive or, or, or something, something like that. It's not about that. And they realize that they can offer services much cheaper than you have today. Um, and that is the whole point, is they understand that they can make their, their business model in a, work in a certain way. But it needs all, all of them to kind of be aligned, but in an understanding way. And that's why I'm saying it. The, the situation is not fixed of what is today. It's what will be tomorrow, which is very difficult for anybody to, to understand. But what I don't like a lot of times in cities is to say, oh, let's try with one or two vehicles. Let's try with one or two areas. Because that doesn't give the scalability, and it gives you nothing. Yeah. Yeah. And that's, that's, where, that's exactly that's the opposite. There, there is this super compelling vision, though, of how the walled garden for a private operator. That is to push out competition. And so coming back to, to what, Karen, you were saying, that there has to be some capacity on the city side to understand this is something that I can work with or something that I don't really want. Tim? Yeah, I think just to add on to what you're saying, Paolo, this is the big difference between the difference between a city that is restrictive and reactive versus being permissive and performance-based. Mm -hmm. Some cities in, around the world have had a very bizarre reaction to the e-scooters. So if you look at all of the city government documents about their policies of sustainability, it's we want to have people in the smallest possible vehicle that's electric power, that's quiet, and that takes the least amount of space in the street. This should get a gold star. But it's like they are running a coal-powered machine down a street that is killing everybody. And they're ignoring the 90% of the vehicles on the street that are actually killing everybody. So, again, they react because it's new and it's kind of like it's a brand new thing. They've heard about five complaints or 50 complaints from people on the sidewalk. That's actually, again, reactive and restrictive. They put caps on it. They've said it can only be in this area. There's no business model to come out of this. They physically can't make this work because it cannot achieve the more important goals, which is mode shift, mode changes, people having more um, access to neighborhoods that they couldn't access before, more access to jobs, etc. The other way to do it is to be performance and permissive by saying, if you want to provide a service in my city, you have to achieve these outcomes. You can, you can do these things. You can't do these things. And if you do these things, I give you access to my right-of-way because I own the right-of-way as a city. But here is what I want you to get me to do. Show me how many people are getting out of their cars using your services. Show me how many people didn't access these areas in these neighborhoods before that they do now. Show me a difference in demographic, not just the, the professional young white males. Show me everybody else that's using your services. If we go in that direction, now we're hitting our comp comprehensive city goals and our outcomes. Oh, and by the way, 
you do need to share some data. We haven't really touched on that. Yeah. And so mass without data is not a data. It's and not a data is can nothing. I, can I just yeah. say mass without data is ASS. Yeah. AAS. Yeah, it's this. Exactly. Karen? Yeah. Uh, let me give an example of a city that is doing exactly what you're saying. And it's not the typical city that you might um, have in mind, it's Brussels, yeah. uh, you know, city with a lot of congestion and so on, and, and not known as the best pupil in class, but they uh, have introduced uh, legislation which entered into force on the 1st of February uh, when it comes to the regulation of new mobility services, and they position themselves as a welcoming city to these new mobility services because they have so many challenges to solve in Brussels that they do see potential for scooters, for bikes, um, uh, in shared systems to, um, to help them address these challenges. And they've built in a number of mechanisms which are not all activated at the moment, but which can be activated overnight if the uh, operators are not compliant. And it includes also uh, data requirements. Um, this is already active for sure. Um, but there's this car-centric thinking also with authorities, sometimes without them being aware of it. Yeah. You know, when, what you're saying about uh, the tiny scooters um, being looked at as the big monsters. Um, there was, a, 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 just an anecdote from Brussels, there was a tweet from a green politician uh, in Brussels who, who um, tweeted a picture showing a wrongly parked scooter on, on the pavement, on the sidewalk. And it said, it's a scandal and it's cluttering uh, urban space and so on. And then there was a tweet from the, the Brussels Minister of Transport from the uh, Socialist Party, um, who then circled all the cars yeah. on the same picture, <laughs> many of them wrongly parked. Right. And, and then, they, and, you know, just to point out also to this green politician, which we tend to think are, are more open-minded <laughs> and less car-centric, right. Uh, you know, just get get the picture straight, and 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 um, it's all about rethinking urban space ultimately. Yeah, I think if I if I may, um, the challenge we've had, and actually, Philip, you had a really good slide about three or four years ago, that showed that when our world is covered in cars, we become blind to them. We've just become so numb and normalized, and we see these two or three bicycles or two or three screens. Say, look, look at that, look at that. And we've forgotten this whole thing in the background that it's doing all this damage to our regions mm -hmm. and our economies and to the climate, et cetera. And so we have to take a little bit of a perspective and say, what actually is going on in our transport system? And how do these things actually benefit or, or not benefit us? And then how do we correct them? Because we can't get rid of a lot of the stuff. We have to actually work with it. And I love the Brussels example because mm -hmm. there's that. There's a few other cities in the world that have just said, if you could meet these criteria, go at it. And then in some South American cities, for example, even in some North American cities, there's 10, 30, 40,000 of these devices. But guess what, guys? To move the needle, we need one or two million of these devices to actually move the needle to change behavior. So if you're feeling a little skittish or scared as an elected official about 1,000 or 2,000 of these devices, you're not ready for this stuff. And we're not ready to talk about masks because this takes a leap that we're, we're not currently not doing right now. I think it's good to remember that in these things, it's, we're not talking just about the transport sector either. For example, one of the biggest hurdles that we're we're facing at the moment is actually taxation. Mm -hmm. So we have currently lots of demand from employers because the companies, they're also facing the same sustainability goals and they, they want to hit those. So there's a huge demand at the moment from them to be providing their employers, uh, employees more services instead of company cars. But then there's taxation that actually prevents it, mm -hmm. which is just silly. Um, and for example, in, uh, we have different countries, for example, in, in Belgium now yes. and in Germany and Holland, where they are starting to put in place these mobility budgets. But once again, for example, the different mechanisms, how they're putting those in place, it would be very, very far from user-centric. So basically that, yes, you can give a mobility budget or for example, a mass package, but people would be having to tick in very manually every single trip. So once again, if you have the choice, you can just jump in your car and drive, or then start putting in, like a diary, every single thing. Mm -hmm. And obviously from us, from technology point of view, we'll try and do our best. But it's that type of stuff that we need to be thinking about also outside the transport sector, that there are several different things that we can actually do and where we can really shift the needle relatively easily. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, 
I agree with you, and I wanted to, to quote an example because uh, I understood this is really a big problem in terms of government, where do we find the solution to, to this? And uh, interestingly, uh, what I said to you about uh, Lisbon and the public transport, so the, the reason why they wanted to, to lower public transport, the prices, is exactly to enable these new mobility services. And actually, interestingly enough, the budget that was required at the national level to fund that didn't come from mobility or transport, it came from the energetic transition. And the reason is because they see it as a way to solve an energetic problem. So less dependence on carbon fuel, and therefore all this new mobility needs to be fueled by electricity. So and, uh, and Portugal is determined, uh, maybe from historical reasons, to, to only have green energy, because that's the only thing we can afford, to, to be honest. And, uh, but as a small country, they realize that can capitalize on it. But mobility was always the problem. It's always uh, carbonized. And so how do we decarbonize that, that element? And mobility as a service really enabled that. And the, the, fu the funds to do that were funded not by mobility, but by the energetic transition budget. And there was 150 million euros that they had to, to find. So there are examples of people that are, are doing that. And I think that's the role that governments and authorities need to be creative because mobility is part of a bigger ecosystem. So use that thing. And, and uh, it's important that, that we realize this. And, and as I said, and I said in the beginning, for instance, Yes, we can solve the problems of cities with, uh, with trying to reduce and with have mobility as a service. And as we saw in London when the congestion charge came in, yes, there are less cars, but then they are overtaken by urban logistics being, being there. So that's why it's important that we think of it as a, as a wider ecosystem in terms of, uh, of um, new mobility or mobility as a service. So it's, it's a widening ecosystem. It's an ecosystem that's missing, quite frankly, a lot of parts. Uh, there are regulatory aspects that are missing, there are hard infrastructure aspects, there are digital infrastructure aspects. We've talked about a few approaches uh, starting from zero, uh, as in Finland, starting from zero in certain local um, uh, uh, authority areas, um, incremental changes, coming back to principles that should guide the mass process. I'm going to finish up this panel, this discussion, with uh, uh, asking you uh, what are the uh, master blocks that are missing. <laughs> if you had one tangible thing that would help increase the uptake of mass in such a way that it delivers on the promise we hope it does, what would that be? Tim, you say it's easy. What is your missing master block? So the fundamental issue affecting every region that I've, I have worked with a lot of regions around the world is the public transport agency opening up its payment to be mobile. If a public transport agency can create a mobile payment ticket with an API, everything else can stitch to, onto it straight away. If you don't have that thing in place, it's not going to happen. And this is not a slide on the PTOs because they all want to do this. Some of them are in these 10-year contracts with these smart card operators, you know who they are, and they're stuck. So the ability for the government to give the PTO the authority to create a mobile payment system that's open with an open API will allow a lot of this to start in place and start small, stitching to the, the bike share company, then the scooter company, then the taxi or Uber, et cetera. Without that, it's just very, very difficult to make this work. Just, just to follow up on that, is it just opening up the payment with an API and making it mobile, or is it also having a negotiated settlement on how those payments should be allocated to different users. Yeah, there's a whole list of things need to happen, but this is the this first. This is the first thing. This is the yeah. first thing so, saying we actually will do this. So, yeah. and by the way, there are apps that can do it for in about four hours. Okay. This is not a fifty million dollar project. <laughs> Technically, that's that's a uh, conceptually, it's a hard thing for some to do. Technically, it's not a hard thing. Out of one hundred percent, what does that represent in terms of the the barrier? Is it 10% and the rest is in the negotiation on what to do with the revenues once they're there? Or is it 50-50? Well, I think in everything, right, in, in the first step of therapy is to admit you have a problem. Yeah. So I think they need that's to That's 100% right so there. So that's the first step. And I think the second step is how do we do it? The right. how do we do it actually is frankly very methodical. And there's a lot of companies that can show you how to okay. do that. It's do we actually want to do this? Do we care enough about this? And do we actually want to open this up? And how do we benefit from that? Yeah, how do we benefit? That? That, those are follow-up discussions, and I'm happy to help anybody on those discussions. But it's really about how, how do we do we want to open up, 
And number two is how do we do it? Open the mobile door. Open That's the door. All right. Open Any the mass door. Next master block, the missing master block that, uh, that you feel would help uh, start the scaling up process. Yep, Paolo. I don't think that we are missing blocks. And I think that uh, I use the analogy of my, my son, you know, when I give him the Lego. And uh, yes, there's a, an instruction guide of what he can do. But I think uh, in the end, what he wants is to have fun. He doesn't need the, the instructions. And uh, we, we become so blocked that we need the instruction. I don't have the right block. Mm -hmm. And it's not uh, round, it's square. And I think we have to, to understand that the blocks will kind of come and work themselves. And I think that the, that's the important thing for cities, for operators, for all the ecosystem. Don't ha get hung up on, on the little details. I have a block with only two slots rather than three. Mm -hmm. That should not be the, the, the stumbling block. Mm. On, <laughs> on a it. whole other school of puns now. <laughs> but but it's, it's important that what is fit for purpose for, for people, and do not, and I really mean that, don't expect to have a master plan because each master plan is different for each city, for each region, for each situation. So to me, it's use the blocks and in a way have fun. To make it fun, and, and coming back to, to your company's role um, in working with a lot of different cities on, on trying to architecture this, to make it fun, would having a common data syntax be something that would be helpful? That, yeah, would that be a missing block that would be, it's not? Yes and no, but uh, I, I don't want data to be an excuse not to do things. Mm -hmm. yeah. okay. And, uh, and uh, yes, there are so APIs. The there's, no, but, but it's, not, it's not an excuse yeah. not to have data. If you don't have data, you collect data. You create ways of, of getting the information that you need. Okay. And, uh, and I think that, uh, uh, as Tim said, payment is, is a problem, but there is a willingness. And you just have to talk to the right people in the right way. And so that's what I'm saying, because the block doesn't fit exactly, doesn't mean it can't work. And sorry, but data is no excuse not to take any action. Sometimes, like Chris has said, there, a push might help. Karen? It's not an excuse, indeed, but um, I think we do need uh, the public sector to, to give that push, uh, to open up data, to share data, to, to get operators to sign up to a system that is not their own and, and that is um, shared with competitors. Because when you talk to these different mobility service operators, they all come with the ultimate app. And their app will be the ultimate app, but well, okay. <laughs> then we still have uh, too many apps, I guess. So how to bring it all together? I think there is an instrumental role for, for cities to play, and it can be done also through the individual licensing of the different operators to you know, impose certain things when it comes to data, interoperability sharing, and, and so on. So I think this is an instrumental element that we need to take into account. And then the other thing is, we just have to come up with entirely new ways of cooperation, um, mm -hmm. which are probably not out there yet, and, and which uh, correspond to the new reality that we're in with these um, combination of public and private uh, sector mobility services. So how do we come to a good model for cooperation? There might be different ones, but also link to that an interesting business model for everybody and who is paying the bill at the end of the day. It seems part of what you're suggesting is a roundtable reality check. Uh, not necessarily along the lines of what Finland did, but coming back to, to first principles. How do we deliver on first principles in this new reality? And uncertain reality. Yeah. Very uncertain. <laughs> Krista, what's your building block? I think every single city hired him and Paolo's son. <laughs> um, I also think that, you know, it, if you really start overthinking it it, it, it seems very, very daunting. But indeed, we're, we're only at the beginning. So for me, the biggest one is the mindset. Mm -hmm. um, this was already something that I was saying when I was working in the government and even, even in a company. I'm, we're only taking baby steps as well. Mm -hmm. So the main thing now is to kind of real, to realize that we have this amazing opportunity to be doing a lot of stuff differently and a lot more efficiently. You know, it, it's not going to be easy breezy, but it's an amazing opportunity to do this. And in the end, it's also, let's try and get out of this polarizing rhetoric that we keep on having. For example, what you were saying about the e-scooters or for example, um, free floating bikes when we got them going. It's at the same time, it's like, 
yes, there's also issues there, but on the whole, this is a bloody amazing thing. Mm -hmm. Whenever, a couple of years ago, would you have been thinking that something like biking or scooters would be as freaking hot topic and sexy as it is at the moment? This is a good problem we're having. So I think that it's that mindset that we need to get through that, okay, let's do things, let's do it together, and really just start thinking, taking step by step and learn by doing. Um, and with that, just open your APIs, please. <laughs> I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to weigh in uh, with my two building blocks um, very quickly. I think uh, one of the things that we see a lot that's happening in this area is that uh, the stitching together of, of mobility as a service is a digital stitching together. And yet, the laws that we have and our regulations are all analog. And I think there has to be a way of crafting law and regulation in digital format so it can be ingested directly by these service operators. We have to be able to push out what the public wants in a way that can be directly used by algorithms, by systems that are running this. So that's one thing. The other thing is pricing. You know, we have to price assets. We have to price public space. We have to price things that that is the way in which we can guide the, the beyond digital law. That is the way in which we can guide outcomes. And it's clearly a missing piece in this whole discussion. So we've talked about a lot of things, and we've come to the end of our allotted time. Uh, and I hope that you've walked away uh, with a, a number of new ways of thinking about mobility as a service, as a, as a video game, as a rock band, as a <laughs> heavy metal, heavy metal, sorry, heavy metal band. Now you all know what the axe is, for those of you who didn't know ahead of time. I think uh, I also want to apologize, and it's purely my fault, for the abominable uh, um, puns that have been used in this session, uh, but Mass does benefit from uh, being able to be punified quite easily. I, I think going forward, uh, we can see that there's little understanding now of what mass is today. There is a lot of hope that it will deliver on a lot of the promise that it, we think it can deliver. Uh, I'll ask you two questions very quickly to, to end this. Um, do you think, uh, I ask you, uh, do you feel that you are can confidently identify mobility as a service today or if you've experienced it. Do you think in 10 years you will have available to you a integrated mobility as a service uh, application, if you will, in your daily life? In 10 years, do you think that something along the lines of what we've described here as an integrated transport package that allows you to move seamlessly from one service to the next will exist in your city? How many of you think that will happen? Okay. Uh, Follow-up question, and this touches on uncertainty. In 15 years, how many of you feel confident that the way in which you'll interact with that service will be with a smartphone? All right, so that's the uncertainty. That's one of the uncertainties. We don't know what's coming down the line in, the inter in this interaction space. And that's something important to keep in mind when we talk about apps, because it may not be apps. It may be something else. All right, well, with that, I'd like to thank our discussion leaders, uh, Paolo, Krista, Timothy, and Karen. And I'd like to thank the audience for, for listening to us this early morning. I hope that you've walked away with uh, some new insights into this, certainly with some bad puns. And uh, we look forward to continuing this conversation uh, during the rest of the summit. You can each talk to the speakers individually afterwards. Thank you very much, and thank our discussion leaders. Thank you.